Well, my first attempt at a helicopter was based on uh, the idea of pulling a big rotor around with little propellers on the blade on the tips. And I tried it with rubber band models and it uh, worked and I could even make it move horizontally by having ailerons that turned cyclically and it would move horizontally. On the basis of that I went to a larger model, still not full scale, but heavily loaded, 20 horsepower, compacted into a 10-foot rotor, made intense uh, stresses. But I wanted to study the stresses, and I really found them even greater than I thought I would. And as an upshot of that, making at least three of these things that blew up, I finally got to this which I've kept as a memento of those years. A, uh, it's made out of forged magnesium, and the blades are profiled in a profiling machine of my own manufacture, exactly the same. Now, understand forged magnesium is very difficult stuff to, uh, well, it has to be tempered just so, and, but it, you can hear this, that that's really like hard steel, only it's one-fourth the weight. Well, uh, that proved to be too complicated. See, they're out on the end of the blade, pulling the big blade around, and there has to be a gear here and a shaft going through the big blade, into the hub, and then another transmission here, and then the engine where my stomach would be to drive this whole thing. And it was just too complicated. So around 1939, I started to make smaller models with five-foot rotors driven by an Electrolux motor taken from a vacuum cleaner with a transmission you see the gears in the transmission? Into that gear, there's a ring gear there and a sun, sun in the middle and the ring gear on the outside. These are the planetary gears. They fit. Do you see that? Yeah. Now, this is, this is actually the second stage. There are two stages. If I take this one out, that's the first stage, so that it makes a 10 to 1 reduction, or 13 to 1 in this case, driving the rotor from the high-speed shaft and coming up through the center of the shaft, a little shaft from the motor itself drives the flywheel separate. That flywheel maintains an artificial horizon and controls the blade which is in this hub which I'm now pointing to. Now those blades are feathered by the flywheel, which is up here and spins at a much higher speed and holds it uh, stable. You can even rock the fuselage and the thing will just stand still in the air. That was my solution to flight, because with the stable model I could then add the remote control, which I did in this case these plungers go into magnets or solenoids and from the ground I can activate one or another and make it go in different directions. Now that was the bottle I took to Bell in 1941. So I was working from 39 to 41 developing these small electric models. And I think that was where I really began to have success because by reducing the size to something I could handle, I could make them, fly them, and wreck them, and then fix them all in one day, instead of taking six months or a year. And this way I could explore different types of rotor and different types of flight, and eventually found this stabilizer bar and flywheel, which solved my problems. But the first flights were quite unstable letting my hand represent the rotor, 
as soon as it would take off, it would tip, dash off to one side, swing, dash back with an even more extreme swing, and might at the third swing upset. And there is a photograph of just that, a movie of that happening. So there was no way to control those unstable models. And after about, uh, well, I think it was model number seven that I got the stabilizer bar and got the stable flight. This, this is an old kite, but you have to imagine blades in this thing that I'm rocking. See, blades fit into those yokes, one on each side. And then the bar tips or feathers the rotor. Now, actually, I'm moving the bar, but in flight, the bar stays at rest. It's the fuselage that moves. But see, as the fuselage or mast rocks, the blades are staying parallel to the bar, so the lift direction doesn't change. In other words, when the mast swings, the lift remains horizontal, so it's just as though it is hung from heaven. <laughs> now, this is intended to be a kite, Believe it or not, this thing will, with the blades in a good wind will fly very nicely. I've had them up 5,000 feet. You can't see them. They're buzzing around. The birds were very curious when they first they heard this sound. They came, and then they got close enough to see that it was dangerous, and it was very funny to see them try to reverse in flight <laughs> and get away from the darn thing. When I arrived at Bell, September the 3rd, 1941, I was coming by invitation of Jack Strickler, who'd heard about this thing from a mutual friend who told him how I had a helicopter that would fly around the barn and out the door and back. So I felt that I had uh, access, I should have access. Uh, so the guard wouldn't let me in, uh, I was infuriated. And I asked for the chief of police, and I said, call your dogs off. I have a helicopter here. <laughs> but the cop thought it was a bomb or something in the suitcase, and he didn't want to let me in. Of course, when he, the chief told him to let me in, it was all right. But actually, it was a sort of a bomb, a time bomb, because Bell Aircraft ultimately became Bell Helicopter. <laughs> well, in this suitcase, I had this model with the rotor blades and the fuselage and even the this part, you remember the, the legs go on front and so on. I put it together and uh, flew it in the factory between the Air Cobras, by which time quite a group of engineers had collected around, not Larry Bell. But I heard later that Larry Bell was walking to the factory with the head of, uh, I think it was uh, Lockheed. And a fellow from Lockheed said, uh, there's something very interesting over there you've got going, Larry. Larry said, oh yes, I want to show you some air airplanes over here and pull them in the opposite direction. <laughs> well, shortly after that, I met Larry and I took a liking to him right off and we made a deal. and. I assigned my patents to Bell, and they agreed to make two helicopters. And I wanted two because I expected the first one would be wrecked. And uh, I think the budget was 250000 Well, when I got moved in, nothing happened. I thought it'd be a big staff of expert engineers who would assist me and immediately translate into machinery what I had in the model, but nothing happened. Finally, uh, my assistant presented me with the budget, 250000 that was okay. And I looked and realized it was for drawing the two helicopters, not for making them. And this uh, was not what I wanted to do. I didn't know how to draw it. I had to make it first and get it to work, and then I could draw it. And so I went to uh, the head of manufacturing who spoke my language, Russ Creighton, told him what the story was. 
wanted to make two helicopters. And he undersigned a guarantee that I would do it for the price mentioned and put the proviso at the bottom, provided the engineering department had nothing to do with it. <laughs> now, uh, you see, I found myself in quite a predicament at Bell. And let me recapitulate, because the two different ways of thinking about the problem, uh, there was a real confrontation there. I'd been working on my own for 12 years, and except for making sketches and having, oh, maybe a school course in mechanical drawing, I didn't know boo about drafting. But Bell Aircraft was set up with the drafting department as top dog. They would draft their airplanes and it meant very careful contour lines to pro provide the streamlined shape and then they had to make dies to this. It, it was uh, a very difficult technique which Bell was very proficient at. They wanted to apply that technique and I wanted to apply my technique of working with my hands and getting something to operate it. So there was a real clash. And uh, since they were not going to do anything anyway, I of course won because I would just start to do something and that would be it. One of the things was to have my own shop in the plant, which was necessary because this flywheel rotor control didn't give any option for the pilot. I needed a way for the pilot to get between the bar or the flywheel and add his contribution. And that took a separate model. Well, uh, that shop was okay for that purpose. Then I found myself having the shop in the factory, having an office in another building about a thousand feet away. And then the main group were of my assistants were on a different plant several miles away. So that wasn't very, didn't work out very well. Uh, so I requested that we have our own plant and our own operation separate from Bell. This took a bit of doing. I finally had to get the real estate agent to find such a place on my own. Once I'd found it and put the proposition to Larry, he okayed it. <clears throat> Not, however, without a certain delay. Uh, the delay, I couldn't figure uh, what it was. The, the money had not been provided for the budget. Finally, it was, I found out, it was because Larry wanted a demonstration of dead engine landing, auto rotation descent, it's called, with the model. Well, I'd never done that even in, back in Paoli. Uh, so I had to figure out something. So I managed to do it in the factory, and so the thing wouldn't just fly anywhere. I had a vertical wire going up to the ceiling, 30 feet, and had the model slide on that wire. <laughs> and uh, I could fly it up and then cut the power and let it descend in auto rotation. Uh, I wanted to make an effective demonstration, so I got two eggs, raw eggs, one to test. <laughs> Unfortunately, I took it up too fast and the egg jounced off, so it didn't prove anything. Then uh, I, had, I told Larry to come at such, such a time, and the second egg I put on, I climbed more carefully and then cut the power and it descended without breaking the egg. And Larry was uh, very pleased and that released the funds and we got our plant at Gardenville where I had my own machinery, milling machines, lathes, saws, welding, drafting room, and a wood shop and an office. And we worked for about six months got a helicopter put together, wheeled it out the door in the middle of winter in the snow, and uh, tried to fly it. <laughs>